Hello and welcome to Money Markets and More with me Dominic Frisby coming to you today from Frankfurt and today we are talking slow motion collapse. Now in 2004 James Turk and John Rubino published The Coming Collapse of the Dollar and How to Profit from It. Make a fortune by investing in gold and other hard assets and I discover from Amazon that I purchased this item on the 18th of February 2006. Isn't digital record keeping amazing? And it remains one of the best books about gold and gold investing that I have ever read. Beautifully articulating the anti-dollar, anti-fiat, anti-money printing, pro-gold narrative. And those that followed the advice of the book will have made good as long as they got out in 2011 and 2012. There's just one thing. The dollar never collapsed. Sure, its purchasing power has been steadily eroded. Each year it buys you 10 or 15% less house, less S&P 500, less good or service than the previous, so that if you compare 2004 prices with today, the dollar buys less than half as much house or S&P 500 as it did back then. Have US wages more than doubled by way of compensation? No. They've gone from about $60,000 to $75,000, average wages. And the taxes you pay on them have gone up as well. Sterling has been even worse. Back then, a pound got you $2. Some people could actually afford a house. But is a 55% loss of purchasing power over 20 years a collapse? Hmm, not really. Currency collapses happen over quicker time frames such as in Weimar, Germany, Zimbabwe, Venezuela. And the dollar is going to collapse narrative. It really got going around the global financial crisis in 2008. And with all the money printing that followed, it looked like a real possibility. In a way, it spawned Bitcoin. And if you think gold bugs are extreme in their anti-fiat narratives, go and have dinner with some Bitcoin maximalists. <laughs> but back then, after 2011, gold went into a bear market. In fact, a bear market isn't strong enough to describe what happened to gold mining. Gold mining really did collapse. And the dollar, meanwhile, actually strengthened. Not versus stuff we actually buy, like houses or equities or cars, but versus other currencies. And I'm saying this because I've noticed a discernible change in narrative over the last 12 months. No longer do we hear about the imminent collapse of the US dollar or a fiat currency. That's sort of gone. Now the buzz is de-dollarisation. I've written about it a lot, spoken about it a lot. The US dollar is the global reserve currency. It's the default for international trade. Participants trust SWIFT and the international banking system enough for them to use it for payment. But there are many nations who would prefer, if they could, to use something else. China would, I've little doubt like to see the yuan replace the US dollar. Russia would rather use rubles, and so on. The de-dollarization theme really took hold uh, in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, when the US weaponized its financial might to confiscate Russian dollars and freeze Russia out of international trade. But whether it's the Russian Davos, where attendees regularly talk about a new system of international settlement. Or France's President Emmanuel Macron coming back from China, where he told President Xi that we should not depend on the extraterritoriality of the US dollar, whatever that means. Or if China making trade deals with major international commodity suppliers, Argentina, Brazil, Russia, Saudi Arabia, to bypass the dollar altogether and trade using the Chinese yuan. Or nations not just increasing their gold holdings at the fastest rate since the 1960s, but increasing their gold holdings relative to other assets. We're seeing de-dollarisation in action. And people like talking about crashes. Crashes get clicks. Crashes sell copy. But they're for the media, not for politics or economics, until they actually happen. De-dollarisation, however, is very much a theme now. It's a mainstream narrative beyond the media in a way that collapse never could be. Politicians never talk about collapse, but, but the 
they can talk about de-dollarisation and it's only going to become more of a theme. But what if James Turk and John Rubino's collapse? That wasn't a single event, but a gradual process, even if the net result, a 50% loss of purchasing power, is similar. And what are the next 20 years? Do I, do I think it's possible that houses, cars or equities will cost more than they do now or less than they do now? If this was the 19th century, they would. Stuff got cheaper. But I don't think there's a chance in hell. In fact, I'd be surprised if they're only double what they are today. Your wages or your children's wages, they might be a bit higher. Your taxes, they'll be higher. Your government or your state, as we tend to call it in the UK, that'll be bigger, more invasive. But while many nations are taking steps to de-dollarise, I would take steps to avoid the constant erosion of fiat money, whether it's pound, dollar or euro. De-fiatise. I don't think that's going to catch on as a term, but erosion reduction should very much be the focus. And if you're interested in buying Bitcoin, I'll put a link to my uh, guide to how to buy Bitcoin. And if you're interested in buying gold, consider the Pure Gold Company with whom I have an affiliation deal. Premiums are low, quality of service is high, and they deliver to the UK, the US, Canada, and Europe. And you can store your gold with them as well. Um, thank you very much for watching. I'll be back with another video very soon. Until then, goodbye.